a full 10% of American men will say yes. Um, that is an unbelievably high number. How prevalent, I guess, are sex addiction? It's hard to determine what is a dysregulated amount of sex and whether or not someone's self-report is accurate. Here's what I mean by that. When we run nationally representative surveys and I ask, do you think you're addicted to porn? A full 10% of American men will say yes. Um, that is an unbelievably high number. And I'm not trying to dismiss people's concerns, but if 10% of American men had a full-blown addiction, a true addiction to porn, we would expect there to be a m much larger societal consequences. I mean, the, when we think about true addictions, we're talking about wages lost, work missed, relationships falling apart, health problems, all of these things. None of those things are currently attached to porn use. So we actually see this phenomena with porn in particular where people will overreport it based on the fact that they're engaging in a behavior that makes them feel guilty and ashamed, but yet they still do it. Okay, so when what point would you say if you looked at like, all right, now this is a problem. Somebody right. 30 minutes a day? Well, no, I mean, it, and so it, it's hugely variable and it, it's going to vary on your, your kind of life circumstances and what's going on. What I would say is, are there objective consequences? So are you finding yourself, um, you know, viewing porn when you're at work and it's creating problems? So I don't mean like, okay, that one time, one year ago, I went to the bathroom with my phone. I mean, like, no, at my desk, I mean, every day, um, or, or you find yourself spending multiple hours per day. So like if you're in a situation where you're viewing porn for multiple hours a day and it's getting in the way of work or relationships or self-care, like, hey, you haven't showered in six days because you've been spending eight hours a day viewing porn. That, that's, a, that's a bad sign. Like that's yeah. not healthy, right? But we are looking for those more extreme cases. Um, and what the more common presentation is someone who might – might go five or six days a week without viewing, but then it's literally all weekend long, completely binge, not engaged in any relationships whatsoever, just almost every waking moment. In porn. Uh, and again, these are extreme examples, but those, those are the types of examples that we see in therapy um, that show up in some of the treatment studies as well of people that it, it's objectively ruining their life. I mean, I, and that sounds like a, a weird criteria to put out there, but it, I mean, that's what it is. Is it actually really creating major problems in your life? And is it more prevalent amongst men, women? Undoubtedly, um, men. Um, among people that self-identify as having sex addiction, that seek treatment from sex addiction, men are more common, um, and typically it's heterosexual men. Um, despite the fact that um, bisexual gay men who have sex with men are actually typically much more sexually active and having more sexual encounters in their daily lives. Um, it's typically heterosexual men that are identifying as having a sex addiction. It's the most interesting sex addiction case you've had. <laughs> um, what's not, it's not actually the sex addiction cases that are the most interesting to me. It's the ones that think they have a sex addiction when they don't. So like talking to someone that might say, I'm addicted to porn. I'm like, okay, so when was the last time you viewed porn? Well, you know, three weeks ago when I was in the supermarket, I was at the impulse counter and I saw this very scantily clad woman on the magazine and I thought of what she might look like naked. And you're like, yeah, but when was the last time you looked at porn? And that's <laughs> what they meant. And it's like this completely warped view of the world based on you know, just complete concerns about, you know, not looking at a woman with lust in your eyes, which is, you know, a thing that comes up in Christian faith a lot. And like, so that's fascinating to me. Again, not a true addiction, but a fascinating worldview to kind of work with in the therapeutic room. Very hard. Doesn't actually work out very well sometimes, but very, very interesting. Yeah, like what what do you do in that kind of circumstances when you may maybe somebody thinks they have an addiction, but it's not really an addiction. Right. Well, if someone is coming to me and asking for help, then I believe that there are a person that's in front of me that needs help. And so Sometimes the help is addiction treatment because you have addiction related kind of behaviors. But sometimes that's something like we, the term we use is acceptance and commitment therapy. It's kind of a school of thought, a type of therapy that's focused more on learning to not get so caught up in the, the struggles. Basically being able to say, I fell short of my goals. That is in the past. I'm moving forward. And so I'm not saying I don't try to tell, you know, if my client's a conservative Christian, I'm not going to say, 
well, first you should be an atheist and then you should be okay viewing porn. Like, I'm not going to say that. I'm going to say, okay, what are your values? How do we live up to those values without causing suffering in your life? And what does that mean for you? And so it looks a little different for everyone, but oftentimes it's about learning not to hate yourself when you fall short of your values and learning not to obsess about those values when you're living up. To them. And so it's this balance of trying to just kind of even things out. Can people really break the cycle? Or do they just change one addiction for another? People can absolutely break the cycle. And I would challenge people to think that breaking the cycle doesn't just mean total abstinence. You know, if someone in college was drinking six, seven drinks a day, living in a perpetual state of hungover to drunk um, and couldn't stop when they wanted, but then come to a point through either intervention or personal decision that they drink once or twice a month, that's breaking the cycle, right? That's breaking a cycle of what looks like an addictive behavior, even if they're not absent, even if they, you, because they, they've chosen to do things in a way that's safe. So there's this notion in addiction treatment of harm reduction. Anything you do that makes you safer and more likely to wake up tomorrow, even in the midst of your addiction, that's breaking part of the cycle. And so, yes, absolutely. And I see people that go through recovery for one substance and never pick another one up. And yes, I see people the other way too, that it, they just seem to transfer one to the other. The person that had alcohol that goes to gambling, from gambling goes to sex, from sex they go to heroin. Like, yes, you see that. But more often than not, I see people that break the cycle or get to a safer place and they don't, they don't go back to that dark place again and they, they move forward.